<laughs> so I'm here today with Steve Parrish, who has very kindly agreed to uh, answer some questions for us. So, mm. hello. Hello, <laughs> nice to see you, Thanks and you nice to be up here in Cheshire. It's nice all, the, to have all you. the posh people live up here, don't they? <laughs> Yes. We do. Right, I thought you did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got some questions for you. Right. Um, a lot of these are from JNS customers, JNS staff, and a few of us as well. Right, okay. Um, so, first off, what's the best bike you've ever ridden and why? Um, that's a really, really good question, and I'd probably have to say, I sound like I'm um, bragging a bit here, but I got to ride Valentino Rossi's M1 Yamaha Grand Prix bike at uh, Jerez in Spain. Um, I got to ride the factory Honda RCV 213 in Barcelona, so borderline between those two bikes, which uh, are pretty impressive machines. Fastest things I've ever ridden, um, 250 brake horsepower, and it makes an R1 Yamaha or Fireblade seem like a step through scooter because they're that fast. So yeah, they would be the best bikes I've ever ridden, full on factory Grand Prix bikes. Back, this would be about five years ago. Wow. Mm, so there you go. Okay, and what made you go into truck racing after bikes? Uh, the fear of having to have a proper job. Um, <laughs> having raced motorcycles for probably 10 or 12 years, maybe a bit longer, I went into running a team for about five years, the Loctite Yamaha team, uh, which was good and very successful. I had some great riders riding for me, Terry Reimer, Rob McElnay and people like that, winning lots of races, but it didn't quite give me the same buzz and satisfaction that you get when you're racing. Truck racing came to the UK, or came to Europe. Uh, my old teammate Barry Sheen raced a DAF truck, and I was envious, so I went to Mercedes-Benz and said, I fancy we go out truck racing, and they kindly supplied me with a truck, and another career started, so I had another 12, 15 years racing trucks, and really keeping me out of a proper job. Well, you're the most successful ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've had a really good career uh, truck racing. I think one of the reasons I liked it, um, I, th there's no comparison, motorcycle racing is the ultimate motorsport as far as speed, adrenaline and excitement and unfortunately pain. Truck racing was a little safer uh, and I think that's why I kind of liked it because I didn't end up in all these strange hospitals that I used to end up in when <laughs> racing motorbikes. Okay, well you've just answered my question there. Do you feel like you're drawn to bikes or trucks more? No doubt bikes. Um, my first love I guess as a hobby um, and as I say I think the skill and ability and, and uh, maybe danger that people go through racing motorcycles, it, is, it far outweighs everything else and I've driven lots of fast cars and everything else like that and, and even the Formula One drivers, people like that, they watch motorcycle racing and they can't believe what they're seeing, so motorbikes number one. Okay, brilliant. Okay, what do you think of Dirtquake and does the amateur element make the race more exciting than say the GP or the World Superbike? Um, I think it makes more fun, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry to say, and that's a little bit what my Mad Tour show is about, it's about the days when we were able to have fun and I think nowadays it's become very commercialised and unfortunately you can't be seen to be mucking around too much because it's on every, like this, <laughs> you're being watched all the time. Um, so I think with something like Dirtquake, seeing the amateur side of it and people turning up with weird and wonderful machines that are all shouldn't be doing what they were doing um, on the racetrack, I think it's really good and I think there's a lot of fun is missing out of most sport these days and probably actually in all sports I guess nowadays it seems so commercialised and so regimented and rather sterile in lots of ways so Dirtquake takes all that away and uh, if you ever get a chance to go and see one, go and see one. We will. Um, in your racing career, what was the scariest moment you've had? Oh dear, um, when the VAT man came round and wanted to see my accounts. <laughs> um, oh dear, I, I, I guess the, the other man, TT, um, and I certainly have raced there back in the days when they didn't stop you racing if conditions were bad and I raced uh, while it was foggy over the mountain in the Isle of Man and you're, you're tearing through the fog uh, at a reduced pace but you're not really sure where the hell you're going and where the cliff edge is and everything else. So I'd say the Isle of Man probably the scariest because it is, it is a, we talk about the sharp edge of motorcycle racing but it is absolutely like a Stanley knife, the TT is a very sharp edge. You can't make mistakes so I think the kind of... Uh, the, the kind of fix that you get from it, the adrenaline fix you get from it, is far far outweighs circuit racing and racing in rain and fog and wind around there probably was the times I was thinking I must be insane doing this, but I'm really pleased I did and I got away with it. Good, good. Yeah. Okay, um, which part of your whole career, so that's racing, presenting, everything, have you enjoyed the most, do you think? Um, it'd have to be racing. Um, very difficult to replace motorcycle racing and I, and I think that is again the same with lots of sports. People forget when you're a kind of relatively high profile person, you're doing very well, you're earning a living from what started out as a hobby, you're getting lots of adulation and people just want to 
meet you and talk to you and you, you I don't know it's, it's a little, you're in a little bubble you're in a little bubble of success um, and I think um, motorcycle racing gave me that more than anything else I've ever done I think my truck racing side and presenting side is it's fun and I enjoy doing it but it, there is nothing like that kind of euphoria of when you've achieved on, on two wheels so that was what I'll look back and all of my life and go and, you know winning that race at Donington or Silverstone or Alton Park somewhere like that was something that you'll never ever replace and that's why I think some people from sports they do get a bit depressed when they stop doing it because they can't fulfill all those sort of exciting moments that they had. We should mm. take up truck driving. Mm. Yeah. Okay what's the greatest track you've ever ridden? Wow, um, probably the one that I loved very much was the old um, Spa circuit in Belgium. They've changed it a great deal, but back in 1977, my first year doing Grand Prix, uh, riding a factory Suzuki RG500, I got to race the old Spa, and again, massively long, um, pretty dangerous, but it had some incredible fast sweeping bends, and I'll always look back on it. The first time I ever beat Giacomo Agostini, the wonderful 15 times world champion, I beat him, and I'm like walking on cloud nine, and, and just, yeah, that, that memory of that track that particular race probably is something that I'll always treasure and yeah, the greatest track for me. Brilliant. Uh, what's the best race battle you've ever had? Oh my goodness me, um, they often um, kind of fall into one another. Um, I had some pretty good, I mean always when you race with what I call famous people, they're good battles and so I had some pretty good tussles with Barry Sheen. I remember one time at Hockenheim, um, we ended up swapping places about 10 times on two or three laps, it was neck and neck and everything else. Unfortunately, he did beat me in the end, as he usually did, but I thought I'd got the measure of him and then he just did me on the last corner. Um, but again, you have to feel proud to race against someone like Barry Sheen, who was just a, you know, the ultimate professional and uh, a, a legend of our sport. So I think probably yeah, Hockenheim, and I think that was 1983, um, having a, an amazing battle with him around there. And just, we were slipstreaming and passing one another and, it was all going on. So I'd probably put that as one of my top races. Brilliant. Okay, um, are the skill levels higher now, do you think? Or is it just that safety standards have increased, the preparedness to take things to the limit? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. The question is the answer. Um, I think that the, I wouldn't say the skill levels are any higher because I think at the time, everyone's skill pushed them as near to the boundaries as they wanted to go and unfortunately a lot of people when they went past those boundaries died because the tracks were yeah. not safe there was no big runoff areas there was a lot of the circuits were street circuits not just the Isle of Man it would be Bruno in the Czech Republic and Spa as I mentioned and the, the old Nürburgring circuit and places like that so I would say that uh, the skill levels you can't transcend from one generation to another but yes yeah, seeing the guys doing what they're doing now is very hard to believe but the fact of the matter is that they've got big runoff areas they've got airbag suits they've got good boots good gloves good helmets and all the protective gear and touch wood most of the time they get up from those accidents and so things have become much much safer so i think you can push the boundaries without the fear of you know busting yourself up pretty yeah. badly yeah. yeah okay um has the huge amount of money in moto gp sucked it from the rest of the sport do you think no, I don't think it has. Um, I think we always have to have uh, aspirational things to look forward to and pretty much every motorcycle racer would want, when they start out at a young age, their sights would be set on something like MotoGP, Valentino Rossi and, and uh, Mark Marquez and people like that is where you would be looking at. Now, whether you actually get to that is another thing, but you have to have something to aspire to going to. Um, there's a lot of money in it, there's a lot of commercialism in it, but it gets big viewing figures and lots of people go and watch it. So I don't think it sucked it out. In fact, I think at times it brings money into the grassroots because a lot of people will watch these fantastic riders that are getting lots of TV coverage and hoping that they could perhaps rise. Maybe a sponsor, a company, a small company might sponsor a young rider and come up through the ranks with him. So I don't think it's taking it away and I think it's something that people aspire to get to. Okay, uh, next question. Do you miss two strokes? I'll, I'll always miss two strokes. Um, I've got one of my RG500s on the stage here tonight. Um, and they were the bikes that I grew up with and, and had the most success with. Um, and I often get to ride them still now, which is um, very fortunate. A lot of people around the world lend me bikes um, and I get to race, race them at tracks nowadays. Um, I've got three or four of my own, which I often start up now and again. So, no, 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 there's two stroke um, smoke inside my veins, no question about <laughs> it. So I'll, I'll never ever uh, forget two strokes, never. Okay, in your opinion, the greatest racer ever on track? 
Again, very difficult because I've come up and seen so many generations. Um, and I could start in the 70s of people like Mike Halewood, Barry Sheen, uh, Giacomo Agostini, and at the time they were the greatest. And then we went through the ranks of someone like Mick and Wayne Gardner, those people. One of the fastest guys I've ever seen on track, um, who a lot of people won't agree with me, but on his day, Casey Stoner was incredible. He did things on a motorcycle that you wouldn't think possible. I, my biggest regret, and it's nothing I could steer, was I would have dearly have loved to have seen Mark Marquez and Casey Stoner's career overlap. Unfortunately, Stoner retired and Mark Marquez became the great Mark Marquez. But I think watching those two guys, the bar would be lifted even higher because they were both of the same ilk. They, they, in my opinion, they went beyond what most people thought you could do um, and, and have got away with it. So, and then of course, no one's ever gonna forget Valentino Rossi, his career that spanned all the way through to, I knew him when he was that high because I raced against his dad, Graziano Rossi. To see him still racing competitively of a career of way over 20 years is phenomenal. So whether he's the GOAT, the greatest of all time, I don't know, but he's been a massive boost for our sport. We dread the day that he retires and I'm a big, big fan. Um, but So I don't think I can actually say who is the greatest ever because I've seen lots of generations and it's very difficult to transcend them through. But those names that I mentioned would be right up there. Okay, same question again, but you can say a few, uh, but for the road. Road racers, ah, now another really good question. You'd probably straight away say Peter Hickman who's got the fastest ever lap around the TT course, but there has been some incredible racers. I think Joey Dunlop, he was racing when I was racing. I finished third to him once at the TT. Didn't see which way he went. He had something rather special about him. So Joey's probably gonna be the greatest of all time as a TT rider. Who knows how many champ more races he might have gone on to win. Uh, John McGuinness is tr incredible, 23 TT wins, he's right up there. Michael Dunlop, also incredibly good, who could even go on, he's still young, I think he's just come up 29, 30 to surpass, I think he's got, I'm going to hazard a guess, 18 wins, something like that, so he could get to 26, which is what Joey Dunlop got. John McGuinness, whether he's going to get another one, I don't know, I think we'd all like to see him do it, but I'm not so sure. Um, but who knows what Pete Hickman's going to do, the speed that he's going around there now, the bar's been lifted again. But I'd probably say Joey Dunlop was the greatest of my period. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, another question here. That doesn't make sense, so well. That's all right. <laughs> cut, cut. Future, any tips for anyone you think to watch out for? Um, mm, um, really, really good point, I guess. Um, the, the, one of the issues that I might have now is I don't get to see people at grassroots levels because I don't go to amateur club races. I don't go to the CV in Spain and watch people coming up and through the ranks and places like that. But um, start we, we, we've had some, obviously some great riders we've got in, in World Superbikes, in, in Moto2, in Grand Prix and everything else like that. But um, I used to watch the Red Bull Rocket rookies and obviously see people coming up through that. I don't, unfortunately, because I don't go to the Grand Prix anymore now and I don't get to see the coverage, um, I really don't get to see the youngsters. And I think nowadays you've got to pick someone out when they're probably 14, yeah. 15 years old. Um, and unfortunately, I don't get to see those guys right now. But obviously, um, we're, we've got some... I, I'm really big fan of Taz McKenzie, who's coming up through the ranks. I know he had a bit of a whoopsie at the last round, and we'll see how he gets on at Alton Park. But I've tipped him to do great things in British Superbikes and then move on from there to go on from that. But as far as the real youngsters come go these days, I don't really get to see them, which is probably my fault, but I'm a busy person. No worries. Now, a bit of a fun one for the last question. Right. Uh, you can answer true, false, or no comment. Right. <laughs> I'm sure I'll, there'll be a comment. <laughs> um, so basically, I've been looking online and we've had a lot of questions mm. about your pranks. Mm. Well, there's lots of pranks. <laughs> so basically, we're just seeing if they're true, false, or no comment. If they yeah. are true, if they're false, right. or if you don't even want to comment. Okay, I will comment on this, but let's just go and buy my book because everything's in there. Oh, is it? Yeah, right, yeah. well, we'll tell them that. Yeah, tell them that. Yeah, the Parish <laughs> Times. It's got, they're all true that's in there. Okay, is yeah. it true you're permanently banned from the Chinese, Chinese Administrative Region of Macau? Is that how you say it? Well, um, the answer to that question is that I was banned, but not permanently, because what happened was when I got banned, the, the Chinese principality or whatever you call it of Macau, which is a corner of China, was at that time owned by the Portuguese. Um, but it went back, like Hong Kong went back to the Chinese from the UK. 
Macau went back to the Chinese, so I'm now allowed back. But there was a period of time for about 10 years or nine years where I was banned from going back to Macau for an incident that took place. <laughs> Are you banned from Portugal? <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, as far as I know, I'm not banned from anywhere at this moment in time. Could be well, Cheshire could soon. could be North Witch tonight, yeah. yeah. OK, is it true you burnt down a toilet block in Finland? Yes, I was part of a, <laughs> a, a, a splinter group that did that. That is very true. <laughs> Okay, did you once pose as a medical doctor to allow John Hopkins to fly from Japan to the Australian GP? Undoubtedly, yes, I did, and he still <laughs> owes me a beer for that. He's never actually paid me back for that, so I got him to got him to fly him when he shouldn't have been flying. Okay, did you upset your fellow village residents by registering P E N one five as a car number plate? Yes, I did. I did. I don't know why they were upset because it said P E N one five, but some apparently thought it looked like penis. <laughs> Did you once pose as Barry Sheen in a qualifying session when you were both teammates? I did. I disguised myself as Barry Sheen because he'd got a bad leg and had to go and see an osteopath, and so I went out and qualified and dressed up as him and went out and qualified for him. Yes, Further that's very grid. true. So nearly everything's true. It is. OK, do you own an ambulance, and have you been using your ambulance to park on double yellow lines and, when the doors open, visit local, your local bank? Yes, an ambulance has been used, and a fire engine for that matter, to park around Cambridge where it's always difficult to find parking places. <laughs> and a hearse for that matter. And this was my next one. Do you own a fire engine? I've sold it, but I'm looking for a new one now because it started to go a bit rusty, but I have owned two fire engines in the past. And yes. have you yes. once hosed down the inside of a friend's packed pub on a Sunday afternoon? Yes, I did with my fire engine at the time. But he got me back because he rang up Jeremy Beadle and got me stitched up by that. <laughs> So yes, actually every one of those truths, little little tweaks here and there, but pretty much all true. Brilliant. Well, your, thank your you. honour, I give in. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much for speaking Absolute to us. Absolute pleasure. And make sure you all go to and and buy all your parts. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah my clothing, most of clothing and accessories as well. Okay. Don't forget, go to JNS. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, buy your book. Absolutely. The Parish Times, available who knows where, on my website, steveparishracing.com, or if you happen to be lucky enough to be here at the Mad Tour, then the signed book's going discounted even. But yeah, there are all the stories and lots, lots more in the book. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>